theme parks and amusement park rides always remind me of myths and legends, particularly those about inner earth. But before we start this episode, I want to give this one a try. Holy shit. Considered by most people to be an entertaining work of proto-science fiction, one of my favorite short stories, which can be obtained for free online, is called A Voyage to Inner Earth, which was also published in 1908 titled The Smoky God, presented as a personal true account related in the form of a dying declaration of a Norwegian sailor named Olaf Johnson. The book starts out with a foreword from the author, Willis George Emerson, in which he states that, while initially skeptical of the story, he felt an obligation to grant Olaf his dying wish by disseminating his account of a fantastic subterranean journey that he allegedly undertook with his father, in which they discovered an entrance to the mythical inner world. Quote, Olaf Jensen, the navigator, the explorer and worshipper of Odin and Thor, the man whose experiences and travels as related, are without a parallel in all the world's history, passed away, and I was left alone with the dead. And now, after having paid the last sad rites to this strange man from the Lofoden Islands, the courageous explorer of frozen regions, who in his declining years had sought an asylum of restful peace in sun-favored California, I will undertake to make public his story. The author goes on to say that, Through his publication, Olaf Jensen made the startling announcement that God created the earth for the within. That is to say, the interior of the planet is not simply comprised of a solid mantle, but littered with vast expanses of caverns containing lands, seas, rivers, mountains, rich, dense forests, and valleys, while the outside surface of the earth is merely the veranda, the porch, where in comparison things grow sparsely, like the lichen on the mountainside, clinging determinately for bare existence. Of course, most people immediately question the scientific validity of such a claim, asking, where would the light come from for plants to grow? Where would the oxygen come from to sustain life? And if populated by people, which Olaf also claims, What sustenance would be available to these alleged subterranean inhabitants? I will address these questions later on in this presentation. According to Olaf Jansen, in the beginning, this world was created solely for the within, or inner world, where the four lost rivers of the Garden of Eden, the Euphrates, the Pison, the Gion, and the Hikadel, are allegedly located. 
These same names of rivers, when applied to the streams on the outside surface of the earth, are according to Olaf, purely traditional and stem from an antiquity beyond the memory of man. Some of the rivers within, Olaf Jensen claims, are larger than the Mississippi and Amazon rivers combined. In point of volume of water carried, indeed, their greatness is occasioned by their width and depth rather than their length. And it's at the mouths of these mighty rivers as they flow northward and southward along the inside surface of the earth that mammoth icebergs are found, some of them 15 and 20 miles wide and from 40 to 100 miles in length. Olaf Jensen asserts that, in the beginning, the world was created by the great architect of the universe, so that man might dwell on its inside surface, which has ever since been the habitation of the, quote, chosen. They who were driven out of the internal Garden of Eden and brought their traditional history with them. Allegedly, the history of the people living within contains a narrative suggesting the story of Noah, and the ark which we are familiar with. He allegedly sailed away, as did Columbus, from a certain point to a strange land he had heard of, far to the north, carrying with him all manner of beasts of the field and fowls of the air, but was never heard of afterward, presumably resettling on the surface. In regards to the ancient origin myths of tribes, such as the Hopi Indians, that claim to have emerged from a subterranean habitat to the surface through tunnels emerging inside of the Grand Canyon. The foreword of the book goes on to say, quote, Ancient Hindu, Japanese, and Chinese writings, as well as the hieroglyphics of the extinct races of the North American continent, all speak of the custom of sun worshipping, and it is possible, in the startling light of Olaf Jansen's revelations, that the people of the inner world, lured away by glimpses of the sun as it shone upon the inner surface of the earth, either from the northern or southern opening, became dissatisfied with the smoky god, the great pillar or mother cloud of electricity, and, weary of their continuously mild and pleasant atmosphere, followed the brighter light and were finally led beyond the ice belt and scattered over the outer surface of the earth, through Asia, Europe, North America, and later Africa, Australia, and South America. Olaf's accounts claim that he and his father accidentally stumbled into an entrance to the inner earth in the Arctic region and encountered a race of people with great stature, or giants. In the foreword, the author postulates that, quote, as we approach the equator, the stature of the human race grows less, but the Patagonians of South America are probably the only Aborigines from the center of the earth who came out through the aperture usually designated as the South Pole, and they are called the giant race. I've already covered the topic of giants in prior videos, which I'll leave a link to in the description. That said, here's a quote from the Smoky God describing the inner earth inhabitants. Quote, there was not a single man aboard who would not have measured fully 12 feet in height. They all wore full beards, not particularly long, but seemingly short cropped. They had mild and beautiful faces, exceedingly fair with ruddy complexions. Their hair and beard of some were black, others sandy, and still others yellow. The captain, as we designated the dignitary in command of the great vessel, was fully a head taller than any of his companions. The women averaged from 10 to 11 feet in height. Their features were especially regular and refined, while their complexion was of the most delicate tint heightened by a healthful glow. They were richly attired in a costume peculiar to themselves and very attractive. The men were clothed in handsomely embroidered tunics of silk and satin and belted at the waist. They wore knee breeches and stockings of a fine texture, while their feet were encased in sandals adorned with gold buckles. We early discovered that gold was one of the most common metals known, and that it was used extensively in decoration. I never saw such a display of gold, 
It was everywhere. The door casings were inlaid, and the tables were veneered in sheetings of gold. Domes of the public buildings were of gold. It was used most generously in the finishings of the great temples of music. The story concludes after a period of time spent in this subterranean world, leaving through an opening to the surface around Antarctica, where the father died in a storm and the son, though rescued, was thrown into an insane asylum for daring to tell the world about where he and his father had been. While it is very easy to dismiss the story as fiction, it is hardly alone in its claims of an inhabited underground paradise that has been kept secret from the rest of humanity living on the surface. Which brings us to this very rare and special map printed in 1740 by Matthias Suter, one of the most important and prolific German map publishers of the 18th century. It is of Schlaraffenland, which is a land of milk and honey, a map of a German concept of utopia. The original map from which this engraving was made was supposedly dropped off at Mr. Suter's map shop left right outside of his door, mysteriously just left there with no further information about it. For those interested, I go into more detail about this in my book called Gods with Amnesia. That said, this map is not of any known landmass on the surface of the earth and has peculiar writing on it, such as saying the light is the same both day and night. I would like to now draw your attention to the bottom right-hand portion of the map, which I found extraordinarily interesting. The writing on it says, in German, and I'll translate, a utopian map of the newly discovered Schlaraffenland. This land was often spoken of, but never located, and nobody knows where it is. This ridiculous fantasy land is composed of many kingdoms, which have all the different vices of life within them, and that this map was delivered by anonymous authors. Could this so-called fantasy map in actuality be giving us a clue as to the polar entrance to the inner earth, which piqued the interest of nationalist Germany in the early part of the last century? As you can see, the writing is on what appears to be a large rock or a mountain with four rivers running into it. Could this map be a portion of the inner world? There are numerous myths and legends regarding entrances to inhabited subterranean worlds at the poles, most taken very seriously by European secret societies of the 19th and 20th centuries. South Africa is renowned for its above-ground beauty, but there are also fascinating mysteries for those who wish to explore underground. The Kangal Caves are located in Western Cape Province of South Africa. They were discovered in 1780 by a local farmer, and the weaving and winding tunnels have helped to make these gigantic caverns one of their most famous landmarks. The caves are rich in rock art paintings, stone artifacts, and other cultural materials showing habitation in the caves going back tens of thousands of years. Although the extensive system of tunnels and chambers go on for kilometers, only a fraction of this is open to visitors who may proceed into the cave only in groups supervised by a guide. The cave's first official guide, Mr. Johnny Van Wassenaer, allegedly walked for 29 hours upright trying to find the end of the caves in 1898. He is said to have calculated that he was 25 kilometers from the entrance and 275 meters underground. His route apparently followed an underground river and so far they're finding more and more caves to support a story that this cave system is an entrance to the inner earth. But for now, it's largely considered a legend so where the caves actually end is still unknown. In 
H.P. Lovecraft's short story, The Beast in the Cave, is set in Mammoth Cave. The plot involves a man on a tour of the caves who separates from his guide and becomes lost. His torch finally expires, leaving him hopeless of finding any way out. Alone in the pitch dark, he then hears strange sounding footsteps approaching. Thinking it's a lost mountain lion, he desperately throws a stone at the source of the sound. The beast is hit, crumbles on the floor, and the guide eventually finds the protagonist, and together they examine the fallen creature with the guide's torchlight. The creature mutters its last breath, reveals its face, and they discover it's a pale, deformed human who actually had lived in the caves for many years. Located in central Kentucky and covering well over 52,000 acres, the Mammoth Caves were established as a national park in 1941 and as a World Heritage Site in 1981 with a staggering 400 miles of surveyed passageways, Mammoth Cave is by far the world's longest known cave system, and that's over twice as long as the second largest cave system in Mexico. Several sets of Native American remains have also been recovered from the Mammoth Cave. Many of these mummified remains indicate intentional pre-Columbian funerary practices and another fascinating discovery was the remains of cane torches used by a yet undisclosed Native American tribe of an unknown origin. Could there have been civilizations that actually took refuge deep inside these massive caverns? Is there more to Lovecraft's fictional story of subterranean troglodytes than just fiction? Our planet's final frontier, an inner world spoken about in myths and legends, but where few have dared to go. Beneath our feet are countless miles of cave shafts and passages. You're looking at the Cave of Swallows in Mexico, which features a 400 meter freefall drop into what is currently the second deepest known pit in Mexico and the 11th deepest in the world. The temperature in the caves are low, Vegetation grows thickly at the mouth, and the floor is covered with a thick layer of bat guanu on which millipedes, insects, snakes, and scorpions live. But this is not the only subterranean world in the region. In the year 2000, the Cave of Crystals was discovered by miners excavating a tunnel for a mine in Mexico. The main chamber contains some of the largest natural crystals ever found in any underground cave. The largest one so far, measuring about 36 feet in length, 13 feet in diameter, and weighs over 55 tons. So these massive crystals are just spectacular. Imagine one carved into a bathtub. The amazingly huge quartz in this subterranean cave have become this large because of the extremely hot temperatures inside of the underground cavern where it has reached a steamy 136 degrees Fahrenheit and this encourages microscopic crystals to form rapidly growing much faster than we're used to seeing in cooler locations. Just gazing at these gigantic beautiful crystals one can't help but get carried away imagining what else awaits further exploration deeper inside these caves. The Hopi Indians maintain that their ancestors did not arrive from the north nor by boat, but instead climbed onto the surface from the underworld. The specific place of emergence of the Hopi legend lies deep inside of the Grand Canyon. I've included a link in the description to a video I did on the Hopi for those that are interested. The prehistoric temples of Malta are among the oldest standing structures which remain from ancient times. These massive stone temples date back to around 6,000 years ago, displaying megalithic architecture that is beautiful and inspiring 
yet on a smaller scale than what we find in places like Egypt. Excellently preserved, these stone structures were covered over with soil, which helped to protect them, forgotten for millennia, only recently rediscovered and carefully restored by archaeologists beginning in the 19th century. The major complexes are deservedly designated as UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Although these stone temples are large in overall extent, the interior chambers don't have enough room to hold more than a few people at a time. Therefore, public worship in large groups, as practiced in typical churches and temples today, would not have been possible. It's more likely that an elite class of priests and or priestesses carried out sacred rites inside the temple and the public was not invited in. The worship of a goddess is usually associated with female priestesses, so the question must be asked, were the temple leaders also the political rulers of the community, uh, in other words, a matriarchal society? People are still searching for answers to questions such as this, for the first inhabitants of Malta left no writing behind when they vanished as mysteriously as they had first appeared around 4000 BC. Due to the massive size, scope, and complexity of the megalithic stone temples and the extensive resources which must have been required to build and maintain them, they must have played a very important part in the ongoing life of the community, but without more real evidence though, we can only speculate and admire at this stage as very little is known about those original inhabitants that conceived of and erected these megalithic monuments. They might have crossed over by sea, possibly from Sicily, which lies about 60 miles to the north, sometime before 5000 BC. The temple builders were agriculturalists, they grew cereals, and they domesticated their livestock. They worshipped a mother goddess, which is known from early statuettes found around the Mediterranean, resembling similar statues found on Malta, several being of uniquely large size. We know from the physical evidence that the worship included ritual sacrifice, but beyond this, little else is formally understood about the type of rites that took place there. In some of the megalithic temples in Malta, men with extraordinary cranial volume were buried. It is known that until around 1985, a number of skulls found in these prehistoric Maltese temples were exposed in the Archaeological Museum of Valletta, but since a few years ago they were removed and replaced in the deposits not to be seen by the public, so only the photographs taken by the Maltese researcher Dr. Anton Misfood and his colleague Dr. Charles Savano Ventura remain to testify of the existence of the skulls at all. Since antiquity, it is well known that the serpent was associated with wisdom, healing, and also belonged to the subterranean world. On the northeast shore of Malta, there's a small village when in 1902, workmen were digging a well, literally fell into the earth. They had accidentally uncovered the outer room of a Maltese cave entrance, which was later discovered to be a complex of caves, three of which were in a series of chambers excavated out of solid rock. And this entrance is known as a type of hypogeum. And hypogeum is a Latin name for underground structure. Later, a series of underground rooms were discovered to have been located in the middle of an ancient Neolithic village and from the construction of the entrance stones, it is now assumed that at certain times, a human sacrifice was chained before the entrance. The entrance and walls and ceilings of some of the passageways and rooms have been found to be decorated with red ochre. And when first discovered, the three caves were crammed with as many as 30,000 skeletons of men, women and children. Once past the entrance, a narrow passageway leads ever downward to a long underground tunnel and a series of caves 
which are reputed to allow one to traverse the entire length of the island and even further. So legend has it that these passageways at one time connected with underground tunnels that go deep into the earth but have allegedly been sealed off to the public ever since a school teacher took 30 students into the cave and disappeared, guide and all. Now, I'm always suspicious of legends and wanted to see if I could validate whether this was true or not, or just a gimmick to impress tourists. So what I found was a 1940 edition of National Geographic magazine that featured a story on Malta, and I'll go ahead and read the relevant part to you. And I quote, Many subterranean passageways, including ancient catacombs, now are part of the island's fortifications and defense system. Supplies are kept in many tunnels, others are bomb shelters. Beneath Valletta, some of the underground areas served as homes for the poor. Prehistoric men built temples and chambers in these vaults. In a pit beside one sacrificial altar lie thousands of human skeletons. Years ago, one could walk underground from one end of Malta to the other. The government closed the entrances to these tunnels after school children and their teachers became lost in the labyrinth while on a study tour and never returned. End of quote. So there you have it. Where there's smoke, there's often fire. But what happened to them and what the entire story is remains a mystery. The idea that our planet consists of a hollow or honeycombed interior is not new. Some of the oldest cultures speak of civilizations inside of vast cavern cities within the bowels of the earth. According to certain Buddhist and Hindu traditions, secret tunnels connect Tibet with the subterranean paradise and they call this legendary underworld Agartha. In India, this underground oasis is best known by its Sanskrit name, Shambhala, thought to mean place of tranquility. Mythologies throughout the world, from South America to the Arctic, describe numerous entrances to these fabled inner kingdoms. Many occult organizations, esoteric authors, and secret societies concur with these myths and legends of subterranean inhabitants who are the remnants of antediluvian civilizations which sought refuge in hollow caverns inside the earth. Assuming that the myths are true, and the earth is at least partially hollow, how could life survive underground? Surface trees and rainforests are responsible for less than one-third of the earth's oxygen, while marine plants, such as phytoplankton, are responsible for up to 75% of the oxygen in the earth's atmosphere, depending on season. The vast majority of our oxygen comes from aquatic organisms. Phytoplankton, kelp, and algae produce oxygen as a byproduct of photosynthesis, a process which converts carbon dioxide and light into sugars which are then used for energy. While the process of photosynthesis usually implies the presence of sunlight, the sun is not the only available light or energy source able to power photosynthesis. Before the discovery of hydrothermal vents and their ecosystems, scientists believed that only small animals lived at the ocean bottom in seafloor sediments. They theorized that these animals received their food from above because the established model of marine food chain depended on sunlight and photosynthesis, just as the food chain on land does. Mainstream academia taught that this was the only way life could survive in the darkest of the deep sea floor. The discovery of hydrothermal vents changed all that. It became clear that these vast communities of animals grew quickly and to larger than expected sizes in the depths without the aid of the sun. Instead of using light to create organic material through photosynthesis, microorganisms at the bottom of the food chain at hydrothermal vents use chemicals such as hydrogen sulfide in what is called chemosynthesis. At the seafloor, there are thriving ecosystems that receive energy not from the sun, but from the heat and chemicals provided by the planet itself. For many thousands of species dwelling in the deep, 
the energy to sustain life does not flow down from above, but comes up from the interior of the earth. Even in the unlikely scenario where every single tree were to be chopped down, we would still be able to breathe thanks to aquatic plant life, for example, algae. The earth has a tremendous amount of water, and these oceans, rivers, and lakes are teeming with numerous species of biologically active, oxygen-producing organisms. That said, one might ask the question, are there any known sources of sustenance available that could provide for a large human population? Since there are known subterranean sources of water, such as lakes and rivers, teeming with algae, there's also a food chain that lives off the algae, such as shrimps, fish, and other aquatic life. There's also another food source, which also doubles as a light source. Lichen is a composite organism that arises from algae in a mutualistic relationship with multiple fungi species. Lichen comes in many colors, sizes, and forms, and are sometimes plant-like, similar to moss, but lichens are not related to mosses or any plant. They're often found growing on rock, have adapted to survive in some of the most extreme environments on earth, and lichens have been known to glow, as of other fungal species, such as bioluminescent mushrooms, or even glowing algae and other organisms. So not only are some forms of lichen edible, even served in some Scandinavian restaurants as a delicacy, but may contribute as a potential light source. The Buddhists, in their theology, fervently believe that subterranean civilizations exist. They believe these underground people belong to a superior race of men and women who occasionally come to the surface to oversee the development of humanity above ground. Whether this is actually done as a malevolent or benevolent act depends on perspective and for many people is up for debate. While the inner earth civilization is called Agartha and the capital city often referred to as Shambhala, whose ruler is said to have given orders to the Dalai Lama in the past, transmitted through certain secret tunnels connecting this inner world with Tibet, possibly its capital city Lhasa. The entrance of this tunnel was guarded by lamas who were sworn to secrecy, but there has been rumors that these secrets were handed over to the Nationalist Socialist Party of Germany, which sent numerous archaeological expeditions to Tibet trying to find fossilized remains of giants, among other things, such as an alleged attempt by the Ananerbe, or Ancestral Heritage Research Organization, to establish communications with what they considered true supermen, who were said to have mastered the forces of the living universe, which they called Vril, but is also known as Chi, Ki, Prana, Oregon, and to alchemists, Ether. In the book, The Spear of Destiny, Trevor Ravenscroft says, quote, It was largely through the initiative of Professor Karl Hoshoffer and other members of the Vril Society in Berlin and Munich that exploratory teams were sent out to Tibet. The succession of German expeditions to Tibet, which took place annually from 1926 to 1942, sought to establish contact with cave communities. Three years after the first contact had been made with the adepts of Agartha and Shambhala, a Tibetan community was established in Germany with branches in Berlin, Munich, and Nuremberg. The adepts of Agartha were known in Germany as the Society of Green Men, and strong measures were taken to keep silence about their real significance. They were joined by seven members of the Green Dragon Society of Japan, with whom they had been in communication for hundreds of years. During the final months of the war, when the Russians reached their quarters in the suburbs of Berlin, they discovered their naked bodies lying in orderly rows, each with a ceremonial knife piercing the abdomen. In Dietrich Bronder's 1975 book, Before Hitler Came, we read, quote, in 1928, the Thule Society, via the strong Tibetan colony in Berlin, 
with which Hoshoffer was in permanent contact, is said to have resumed the links to Tibet's secret societies of monks, which were even maintained during the Second World War. They used, in radio communications between Berlin and the Tibetan capital of Lhasa at this time, was the book Zayan, a secret book of magic of Tibetan sages. The links to Tibetan Buddhism forged by Trebish, Hoshoffer, and Hess were represented by Karo Nietzsche, an emissary of the Tibetan Agartha in Berlin. He wore the brush-shaped mustache that indicated an adept. On the evening before the outbreak of the Second World War, Schaffer's SS expedition departed from Germany for Tibet, guided by Koronichi and Eva Spulmuller, bringing the Dalai Lama radio equipment with which to set up links between Lhasa and Berlin. Schaffer's SS men were permitted to enter the holy city of Lhasa, otherwise barred to Europeans and Christians, and even the Lama's magnificent temple, containing one single enormous object, the holiest symbol of the Mongolian Empire, the swastika. In a French book, Le Temps Kabbaliste, which translates to Kabbalist time, it says, quote, there was continuous contact between National Socialist Germany and Tibet. There were also claims that Schaefer had brought the Fuhrer a document of inestimable value and that the Fuhrer locked it away in a dark corner of the bunker at Rastenburg, where he was said to meditate. This document was a parchment on which the Dalai Lama had signed a pact of friendship with nationalist Germany, where Hitler was known to him as head of the Aryans. One item out of all those brought back by Schaefer deserved particular attention, the Tantra ritual Kalak Chakra, and a detailed dossier containing this tantric initiation the first document on this subject to reach the West. Meaning to weave in Sanskrit, the term Tantra implies to a set of spiritual practices that direct the universal energies into the practitioner, thereby leading to liberation from the physical level of existence. Samadhi is a state of consciousness characterized by clarity of perception and the absence of the ego. It is the state of consciousness sought by all schools of meditation, a piercing of the veils of one's own subconscious mind into the superconscious. This and other occult spiritual techniques were said to have been practiced by members of the Thule and Vril societies in Germany. The medium Maria Orsic was leader of the Vriller Innen, comprised of beautiful young ladies who in pre-World War II Germany conducted research into psychic phenomena and advanced propulsion technology, including saucer-shaped aircraft known in ancient Sanskrit texts as Vimanas. Their real society, whose members included some of who would later become notable members of the Nationalist Socialist Party, believed that many ancient civilizations owed their origins to refugees from Atlantis and the people that dwelt inside of the earth. They advanced the idea of a subterranean civilization ruled by an ancient parent race who had mastered free energy. This Aryan breakaway civilization was said to have survived the antediluvian cataclysms which ended the Ice Age and continued to thrive below the surface of the earth. Before World War II, Germany claimed the territory of New Swabia or Neuschwabenland in Antarctica, previously known as Queen Maudland and sent expeditions there, including the last one in 1938, where they began building secret deep underground bases below the ice, only reachable by U-boat or submarine. They then defeated a post-World War II attack by Allied forces in 1946, led by Admiral Byrd, who took over 4,000 military troops from the US, Britain, and Australia into an invasion of Antarctica, where his forces encountered heavy resistance from unusual saucer-shaped craft that inflicted substantial damages and caused them to retreat. According to a published interview he gave, which is translated from Spanish and published in my own book, stating that it was, quote, necessary for the U.S. to take defensive action against enemy air fighters which come from the polar regions. Shortly after, Secretary of Defense James Forrestal 
allegedly committed suicide, while some close to him suspect that he was actually thrown out of a window. The true events of his mission in Antarctica, which were rumored to have included finding an entrance to inner earth, are still kept top secret and confidential as Operation High Jump. The possibility that the earth contains massive subterranean caverns, or is at least partially hollow, and that these regions are accessible through hidden passages, and that ancient secret breakaway civilizations flourish within them, has renewed people's interest in the subject still considered by the media to be taboo. Could the Earth really have entire inhabited cities underground that we're unaware of on the surface? One of the most famous hollow Earth proponents was John Sims. He actively disseminated his theory of concentric spheres and polar voids until he died in 1829. In a pamphlet, Sims candidly wrote, and I quote, I declare that the Earth is hollow and habitable within, containing a number of solid concentric spheres, one within the other, and that it is open at the poles 12 to 16 degrees, and I am ready to explore the hollow, end quote. He pledged his life to promoting his notion and toured the U.S. with a handmade wooden globe that opened out to reveal its secret internal layers. People were receptive to his ideas and his following grew. His supporters began petitioning the government to finance his efforts to explore the Earth's interior. On March 7, 1822, Senator Richard Thompson presented a case to Congress for Sims to be supplied with, quote, the equipment of two vessels of 250 to 300 tons for the expedition and the granting of such other aid as government may deem requisite, end quote. During the debate, it was suggested that the Committee for Foreign Relations become involved, as the trip may well bring Sims and his crew into contact with new races of interior people. But the motion failed. Seven further bills were presented to the House, but not one of them succeeded. Sims spent the rest of his life lecturing and lobbying for action. In May 1829, Sims died, totally convinced up until the end that the greatest discovery in the history of mankind had eluded his grasp. William Richard Bradshaw was an Irish-born American author, editor, and lecturer who was best known for his novel, The Goddess of Advitabar. His novel used Simsian geography from the ideas of John Sims to describe a utopian civilization living inside the earth. In the story, a war breaks out amongst the people of Avdabar when the subterranean goddess falls in love with a man from the surface world. Following the conflict, contact is established with the surface world and trade relations are opened. It was published in 1892 and featured an illustration of the inner earth. In the Popol Vuh, an ancient Guatemalan manuscript whose title means Collection of Written Leaves and which has been described as the great storehouse of Mayan and Central American legend and mythical history, there is much talk of a land in the east on the shores of the sea. This description neatly fits Plato's position of Atlantis. The Popol Vuh proclaims that it was from this land that the fathers of the people had come and that they had also endured a great catastrophe, after which the land to the east disappeared. Archaeologist Harold Wilkins remarks in Mysteries of Ancient South America that there are ties between Atlantis and South America, and I quote, One of the South American colonies of Atlantis may, probably, have been the land called Brazil, and Brazil, indeed, was actually the ancient name of the land and born thousands of years before the arrival at Rio de Janeiro of old Pedro Cabral, the Portuguese navigator, that occurred in AD 1500 and has given rise to the sheer legend that King Emmanuel of Portugal named the land Brazil because the dye wood, Brazil wood, was found there. As a matter of very curious fact, the name Brazil was known to the old Irish Celts as High Brazil." End quote. 
and the Hollow Earth, Dr. Raymond Bernard, an American archaeologist who now lives and continues to work in Brazil, reveals that, and I quote, Mysterious tunnels, an enigma to archaeologists, exist in great numbers under Brazil, where they open on the surface in various places. The most famous is the Roncandar Mountains of northwest Mato Grosso, to where Colonel Fawcett was heading when he was last seen. End quote. Colonel Percival Harrison Fawcett was a British archaeologist and South American explorer. Along with his eldest son, Fawcett disappeared under unknown circumstances in 1925 during an expedition to find Z, his name for a lost city which he and others believed to be El Dorado in the uncharted jungles of Brazil. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon, as well as through various other major book outlets. If you'd like to support my work, you could do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description section. I appreciate it. Thank you. Please have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.